Well, hello, friends. You are to be commended for being the early arrivers for our premier service today. Um, just wanted to take a minute to chat with you and to do something that I don't always get to do, and that is to thank people that play roles largely behind the scenes. People like Sarah. You know, we have Sarah leading us in the worship songs, but boy, if you were here to watch that recording process and to see Sarah singing and engaging us so so effectively, and she's in an empty sanctuary. And to, to hear her in here, last week I snooped on her a little bit and watched her singing and talking to us and uh, how she just does that so seamlessly and seemingly effortlessly. But we thank you, Sarah, for the great job that you do week after week. And also to thank the ladies that record the lessons for the children. Uh, I'm just using first names, but Janice and Betty and Lorna and how they keep, uh, keep our kids stimulated and challenged with some very uh, inspiring lessons from the scripture. And to thank Gail, who records them, and Gail plays a lot of different roles here uh, in behind the scenes kind of things, and we appreciate that. In fact, Gail and Edna are two people that are usually part of my live uh, congregation. I, I'm not as good as Sarah. I can't just do it to an empty room with a camera, but I like to have a couple people to look at, and those two are often in that number. And then there's Grant and Dan, who provide the IT expertise, and uh, without them we couldn't go forward. And so there's so many people like that. Then, then the people, those of you that are making the caring phone calls, organizing that, Kathy, and uh, I think there might be 20 of you that are making phone calls, uh, keeping in touch with people, and I really appreciate that. The, the reality is that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has caused us to scramble a bit, but we really have another campus now. You know, besides the, the campuses that we thought we have, I believe that from now on we have an online campus, and that's a good thing. And we have people every weekend watching from a number of different states. It's pretty fascinating to, to hear about that. And do have some um, good news, I'm kind of vague about this, but in another few weeks, uh, a, a baby step toward being able to come together where we see each other and not just virtual worship is we're planning a parking lot worship where um, we'll be asking you to stay in your cars but you'll be able to hear Sarah and the preacher on your radio in your car. And so more news to come. Hopefully this next week I'll be able to shed more light on that plan. But I just want to welcome you and tell you that we're going to get underway officially with our premiere in about four minutes. God bless you. Thank you.
hello and welcome to all of you who are joining us for our PAUMC Fresh Start service today. We're so blessed to have you with us. We're blessed that we're able to worship together in heart and spirit, even if we can't be together in the same place at the same time right now. This weekend, we are beginning a new series on the book of Philippians called Living Well in Troubled Times. And this weekend, Pastor Bill is going to share a message on the first chapter of Philippians called Live Worthy. But before we get to that message, we do have our time of worship through song. And this is a time when we hope and pray that you can open your heart, express your heart to our awesome God as we spend this time worshiping him together.
awesome to know that we are who he says we are. There are so many voices that we hear in this world and sometimes even in our own minds that can tell us lies about who we are. But it is all about who God says we are. And we are his beloved, we are his chosen. And we are here to worship him. We're here to meet with him tonight, today.
Let go. 
Oh, Lord, how we thank you, how we praise you. You are so good, and you are so faithful to us. And God, it is because of your unfailing love and your faithfulness that we can say that it is well with our souls, no matter what mountains are in front of us, no matter what storms we find ourselves in, no matter what is going on in our lives, you're faithful. And we can say that it is well. Lord, help that to be what our hearts say, what our hearts cry. Let it not just be a song to us, but let it be a statement of truth from our hearts and souls today. That it is well with our souls, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, because we know that we're safe and secure in you. God, you are good and you are faithful. And we're here for you today. God, we thank you for this time that we could gather together in spirit and heart. Lord, that we can worship you together and that you hear our praises, you dwell in the praises of your people. God, we thank you for being with us, for being with each one of us and connecting us by your spirit. God, we set this time aside to spend together in your presence. God, we give you thanks, we give you praise, and we pray that you would help us to be open and ready to allow you to change us from the inside out today. God, we give you thanks and praise. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. With me. Amen. Well, hello and welcome. Uh, I am Pastor Mark, and we're glad that you're tuning in with us this week. And uh, we would just want to remind you that at the end of the message, we will be having communion. So if you need to get your communion elements around, uh, it's a good time to do that now. I also want to thank Sarah for leading us in worship every week. She does a fine job, and that helps prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the message. And uh, we, just, we just really thank Sarah for sharing her gifts with us. Another reminder that on paumconline.org, that's our website, you can find uh, Children's Faith Builders Lessons. So go there, uh, and they're also on Facebook that we have a, a small staff of teachers and a, and a techie that are helping to put those together just for your kids during this time. Also on the website, <clears throat> you will find connect cards and you can fill those out. It's important to stay connected. We want to hear your prayer requests and we love to hear your praise reports. So if you do that online, it's all electronic. You just hit send and it goes right to the church. Another reminder that uh, you are very faithful with your tithes and offerings, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that uh, through this time. And also on the website, there's a button there you can click. And uh, I did that today. I was checking that out. There's at least five or six different ways that you can uh, send in your tithes and offerings that are on the website. Any one of those is tailored just for you. And we also have devotional materials, and it's in the form of this book called Open Doors. You can find this devotional, it's a daily devotional, in the mailbox outside of the Pine City campus uh, entrance, and it's also going to be on the back porch at Watkins Glen campus. Pick it up, it's a daily devotional, it's a good way to connect with the Lord every day. So now, Let's sit back and engage with Pastor Bill as he brings the first message in a four-part series uh, from the book of Philippians. Hello, friends. We're happy that you're with us, but as I say that, I'm coming to you in kind of a somber note because of the ugly injustice and bigotry and hatred that has surfaced in our nation over the last couple of weeks. Um, as most of you are all aware, uh, the, the murder more recently of George Floyd, but there's been a few other incident, incidents like that as well. And it's sad to say that we, I feel the need to addre address this first. 
And I was thinking about this. There were three passages that s- stood out to me. The first one comes from Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. And you have them on the screen, and you'll see them if you have the notes downloaded. Uh, would you read those verses with me? Open your mouth on behalf of those unable to speak. For the legal rights of all the dying, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Uh, We cannot be silent. We need to open our mouths and say this is not what we wish. This is not what we represent as followers of Jesus Christ. And then there's a verse that uh, comes from Romans 12. You see that before you? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think it was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King who who said that the, the antidote or the remedy for hate is not to return hate, but love. And we're called to return love for hate. And I, I think that uh, the whole situation with the COVID-19 virus has caused people to be all the more fearful. And out of that fear, uh, it tends to bring out the worst in us. I say that not to justify or make excuses for, but I think that dynamic is going on as well. One more verse that I would include is from uh, 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And so I share this somber note with you And I would like to ask if we could pause for a moment of silent prayer before I lead you in prayer. Let us be silent as we pray for our nation and for the situation that we're facing these days. Let us pray. Dear God, in our efforts to confront and dismantle racism, we understand that our struggle is not merely against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, those institutions and systems that would keep racism alive by perpetuating the lie that some members of the family are inferior and others superior. Create in us new minds and new hearts that will allow us to see brothers and sisters in the faces of those divided by racial categories. Give us the grace and strength to rid ourselves of racial stereotypes that oppress some of us while providing entitlements to others. Help us to create a faith community, a church, and a nation that embraces the hopes and fears of of oppressed people of color where we live as well as those around the world. Heal your family, God. Make us one with you. Make us one in union with our brother Jesus and empowered by your Holy Spirit. Amen. I credit that prayer to the sisters of... uh, I had to find the Sisters of Providence from Indiana. I really was touched by, the, by that prayer. So as Pastor Mark mentioned during the announcement time, we are beginning a series of uh, four messages on the New Testament book of Philippians. And Philippians is a very brief little book. It's only four chapters. And I'm pleased to tell you that uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Nicole are going to be working with me on these uh, four messages and uh, I just uh, listed before you the general theme of each chapter and it'll be up to Mark and Nicole to decide how they want to take the chapters that they develop but uh, reading the first couple verses actually the first two verses of Philippians Paul uh, he's writing along with Timothy his son in the faith and his introduction to the Christians in Philippi, that's where we get the name Philippians from, um, is different because he thinks of them as such close friends. You know, he, it's not a proper uh, letter like to some, uh, he wrote to the Christians at Rome, Romans is very formal and proper and he's never met them before. 
But if he if the Apostle Paul had a favorite church, it probably was the Philippian church. And he says this, uh, he, he begins the letter this way. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a unique way. It's just a warm Hey, I love you guys. I miss you. Um, Paul's writing this Philippian letter from jail. We think actually that he was imprisoned in Rome for probably at least two years. And Philippians, along with Ephesians and Colossians, are three letters that he wrote from a prison cell. And furthermore, not only was he in a prison cell, but he was very likely in chains, chained to a Roman soldier or a guard. And so he's the constant. The guards come and go, but there's Paul uh, stuck in this prison cell. And boy, if that was me, I'd be so down about that. You know, talk about being quarantined by a virus. Can you imagine what he's, he's so active. He's used to being so busy, and now he's constrained by these chains. Uh, just cramps his style big time. And um, it's interesting uh, that he has a captive audience, that they're listening. Uh, the, he had a, Paul had somebody that he dictated his letters to, so they're taking notes, writing down what he wants to say in these letters. The Roman guys, they're listening. He has no choice. He's chained to Paul. In fact, Paul says uh, a little bit later in Philippians 1, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout this whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So this was an unexpected detour. He didn't really want to be there, but he's making the most of it, and he's realizing how God is using this for God's good, even though it certainly was seemingly a, a huge step backward. Now, I, I'd like to pick up again, um, reading, having you read with me the part that I included uh, in your notes, and it should be on the screen, um, beginning with verse 3 through 6. Would you read that with me? I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And uh, that's powerful. He says, I'm confident that God's got this and that God who has begun the good work in you will continue to work out God's work. Um, he says a little bit later, it is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I'm going to fast forward over to one more verse, and this will end up being our memory verse toward the end of this teaching. But in verse 27, he said, Whatever happens, live your lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's where I get the theme for this chapter. Live worthy. Live your lives. Conduct your lives. I actually, the King James Version said, let your conversation be. Now, as you talk with other people, as you live your life and you walk your talk and you talk your walk, live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's uh, the way we see Paul explaining things in Philippians chapter 1. When he says, um, I always pray with joy, at the end of verse 4, I circled the word joy because that's the first of 14 times he uses the word joy in these four short chapters. He, he wants you to get that idea that joy is ever so important. Now, some of you that know me well uh, know that I couldn't read first or Philippians 1, 6 without thinking of the, the song by Steve Green. But my brother watches this from Arizona, 
and he's really been on me. He says, Phil, if you're going to bust out in song, you need to give people a chance to run for the door, you know, so that they don't have to hear that. So this week, Vic, I'm not going to sing. I, it's really tough on me. Other people like my singing, but my own brother, not so much. I think it's because he sounds like me, or I sound like him. I don't know. But the words, I'm going to quote these words. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. That is the good work. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. If the struggle you're facing is slowly replacing your hope with despair, or the process is long and you're losing your song in the night, you can be sure that the Lord has his hand on you, safe and secure. He will never abandon you. You are his treasure and he finds his pleasure in you. So he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Now the good news is I'm not going to sing this song, but Sarah Height, our worship leader, has agreed to sing this as our closing song for the time together. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, my brother will really appreciate that. But he says, I, I am confident, I have the confident assurance that God's got this. He who started it, is going to finish it. Um, I think I'm quoting Chuck Swindoll when I say this, and the statement is this, God who is large is in charge. Say that with me. God who is large is in charge. Now that applies to bigotry and hatred and racism, and it applies to the fear and the uncertainty about the, the virus, and all of this from beginning to end. God is in charge. Our United Methodist founder, John Wesley, there's a lot of things that I'm concerned about today related to the United Methodist denomination, but I am very proud that we were founded by this man of God, and one of the foundations he gives us in our heritage is his understanding and his teaching about three different kinds of grace represented in the scriptures. And this will be familiar to some of you, but the first kind of grace that John Wesley lifted up is what he called prevenient grace. And that word prevenient actually means to go before. It's the way God goes before us even before we know God. You know, God's got it and God's working in our lives. And there, if you look back, there's little ways that you realize how God used something bad for good. And so prevenient grace is, another word is uh, preparing grace. That God is preparing us to walk with Jesus uh, or preventing grace. Uh, God is seeking us even before we realize it. Um, Sarah and I have a favorite verse that we often quote, and that's Romans 5.8. Uh, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So before we even knew that we needed somebody to die for us, Jesus did that. Jesus taught in Luke 19.10, the Son of God came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we have the prevenient grace of God seeking us and saving us. And that's the difference between the Christian faith and most other religions. They're pursuing God. Well, we have God seeking after us. And so that's the first form of grace that John Wesley uh, lifts up from the scripture. A second one is what he called justifying grace. And that's based on the, the theological word justification. Billy Graham explained that word as meaning just as if I had never sinned. And that's where he takes our sin and he offers us Jesus' righteousness. And Jesus uh, replaces our sin with his saving grace. And that's coming to know Jesus Christ is one way we put that. Or new birth, to be born again. There was a man in John chapter 3 named Nicodemus who came to Jesus and he was one of the high priests, but he knew there was something about this teacher Jesus. And he comes to him by night and he kind of hems and haws and skirts the issue. And Jesus very bluntly said, I tell you this, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Evidently, that happened in Nicodemus' life. We, another translation for born again is to be born from above. Last weekend, if you didn't get to hear uh, our soon-to-be new pastors, Mark and Nicole, 
they each shared a little bit of a word with us, and both of them, in their testimony, talked about the time when they were born again. And they came to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And that is this justifying grace that we're talking about. It's so important that we keep that in mind. In fact, it was so important to Paul that in another one of his letters, uh, this is called Galatians, and Galatians 4.19, he said, this is the Amplified Translation, my little children for whom I am in pains of labor until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. He's agonizing over the people reading his letter, wanting Jesus to be formed in them, just as if the birth process, you know, that um, to be born again, to have that new life come into us. And so we see prevenient grace, we see justifying grace. And then the third form of grace that John Wesley mentioned was sanctifying grace. And that is the completing grace, the finishing grace, the forming of Christ in us. That's the spiritual formation process that uh, takes the rest of our lives. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus for the rest of your life. That's the exciting part of it. Um, I, uh, I have been blessed to have the experience, uh, Linda and I have had the experience of, uh, we had a, a house built uh, in our last church in Farmington. We had a brand new house built, a uh, stick built from scratch. And we got to watch the process, you know, and we were, well, I was probably there bugging the builders like t- twice a day, just watching what they were doing. And you watch the, the dig a big hole and then you see them uh, put the footers in and the carpenters are there to build the forms for the concrete and they poured the concrete and they laid the blocks and then they put the deck of the floor down and then the walls start to go up and you see all kinds of different uh, levels of skill involved in that and uh, the first part of the house building process whether it was that house or then we watched uh, as they built the Farmington United Methodist Church building, 13,000 square feet, I still remember the square footage, and watching that on a bigger scale than, than our simple house. And then a few years ago, we uh, took the old place at the lake and they knocked it over and threw it in a dump truck and took it away and we watched them bring in, in fact, Linda was just, Facebook reminds you of these things, I think she said it was uh, seven years ago this week that we watched the two half houses come down on wheels and now they're formed together and there a marriage took place so to speak and that's our house but in each case we we watch the construction process and the first people aren't the highest skilled people but they do the rough work the the rough carpentry the framing carpenters sometimes they're called they do the big pieces and the foundation part and the early stages of the construction process but most significant are the people on the other end of the process who are called the, the finishing carpenters, uh, the cabinet maker level. You know, that they, they are very careful in the way the end product comes out. They add the final finishing touches to things. And I think about Jesus. He's the master carpenter. And he takes us from the rough, basic beginning and we come to know him, and he, we're formed in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is formed in us, and we end up completed. Uh, but that's the end of the story. We're someplace in between right now, aren't we? Uh, until the day of Christ Jesus, we continue to grow and become more like the Lord. Uh, a very helpful thing to me is the way John Wesley then explained those three types of grace. And uh, this was one particular sermon, but uh, it's one of my favorites of Wesley. He likened prevenient grace to being the porch on a house. You know, in the porch, you're, you're not in the house, but you're kind of getting to know the people that live there. And you're just kind of hanging around. And uh, the porch is part of the beginning process. Uh, I think of people that may have happened to cross this online campus recording right now. Maybe you just happen to be here. Well, perhaps it's God's prevenient grace that brought you here today. Some of you have been on the porch for a while. I, uh, I'm blessed to see people that check in, and you see who's, who's watching. 
and and I, I, I see some regularity. And I mentioned people in several different areas of this state and other states. And it's fascinating to realize, hey, there's some people on our porch, you know. Um, part of our job as a church is to entice you from the porch through the doorway into the house. And that's where justifying grace. So prevenient grace is the porch level of the house. You're not completely in, but you're not out. You're, you're kind of being prepared. And then the justifying grace is when you decide, by golly, I'm going to take a step through that door. I, I want to explore what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to have that personal faith, that relationship with Jesus. I want to be born from above. I want to be born again. And when we take that step, that's huge. And, and that's when we, we say, okay, I'm going to leave the past life behind and I'm going to step toward Christ. And uh, I, I think of uh, a slightly different way that Jesus used the door image in Revelation 3.20. And I have here a very familiar picture that many of you have seen, and I've got it so you can see it, but you see Jesus there, and if you look, the shape of the door, something, I'm just guessing, around here is the shape of the heart. And that symbolizes Revelation 3.20, where it says, uh, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And so, uh, using the door in a slightly different way, we're invited to take that step of faith and to realize that the Lord has been knocking at the door of our lives. Will we open ourselves to him and cross the threshold into his house? My prayer is that there are people that will do that even today. So we have the porch and the door and the house. Um, I think of that memory verse that you had before you. Would you read that with me again? Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I always want you to know where those verses are. Where is this one? Philippians 1, 27. And A means it's the first portion of that. And so we are on a, a wonderful journey. We are on an adventure of following Jesus and taking the step into faith and then that sanctifying grace comes to play when we explore what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And there's so much to that, to be finished and to be completed. Uh, do you ever feel like you got so far to go? I, I sure feel that way. But to know that we're going in the direction that he wants us to take and to give more and more of ourselves over to him. Now, I must add this little point of qualification. If you take that step into the house and then you spend your life looking back through the keyhole, looking back at the old life, nobody's more miserable than that. So now you take the step and you say, Lord, I'm yours. I want to be completely yours. I want to give as much of myself as I can to as much of you as I can understand. And I allow you to do that in my life. And that brings me to what Holy Communion can mean. Holy Communion for the person that has um, just invited Jesus into their life can be a, a new step. When you uh, take that bread and you dip it into the cup or you partake of the juice, you are entering into new life. For those of us that are in the house, it's a recommitment. It's a, uh, Lord, I, I'm in. I'm still in. I want to follow you the next step, whatever you have for me. So whatever comes my way, I trust you, Lord, to take care of that as well. Remember that it was on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us that he took bread and he gave thanks to the Father and he broke the bread. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And at that same supper, when the meal was over, he took the cup. He th gave thanks to the Father again. He offered the cup to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of your mighty acts, Lord Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour your Holy Spirit on us again, Lord, on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory And we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So whatever your situation, wherever you are, if you serve one another or you choose to serve yourself, the body of Christ is given for you and the cup of salvation is offered to you. Will you just now partake? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
Thank you, Pastor Bill, for sharing that message and for leading us in that special time of communion. As we begin to near the end of our time together today, we just want to remind you that we're so blessed that you've joined us. We do have one last song of praise to sing together. And if you'll remember back to Pastor Bill's message when he shared from Philippians 1.6 that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And he mentioned that we're going to be singing a song that repeats that verse almost exactly. And that's the song that we're going to sing together right now. This song reminds us that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it in us. So let's not just sing about this, but let's be open to allowing him to complete that work in us as we live out our lives from this moment on. you and have a blessed week.